speaker today is uh, David Cataforis, Associate Professor of Art History at the University of Kansas, where he teaches the history of American, modern, and contemporary art. His writings on Wen the Gu have appeared in several scholarly journals and in books, including Wen the Gu, Art from Middle Kingdom to a Biological Millennium, Translating Visuality, and Wen the Gu at Dartmouth, The Art of Installation. Please welcome David Cataforis. Good afternoon. I would just like to say that I'm deeply honored to participate in this remarkable symposium, and I'd like to echo the thanks that, that many of the other panelists have expressed to the Smithsonian American Art Museum for hosting this event, to the Terra Foundation for funding it, and to um, Cindy Mills, Amelia Gerlitz, and their colleagues for organizing it and helping it to run so smoothly. One of the major Chinese-born avant-garde artists of his generation, Wenda Gu, who was born in Shanghai, began his career as part of the 85 movement in China, relocated to the United States in 1987, and achieved international renown in the 1990s. During this decade, Gu has spent increasing amounts of time back in China, participating in that country's booming contemporary art scene. He now largely divides his time between Brooklyn and Shanghai. This transnational experience has led Gu to create numerous artworks dealing with east-west interchange of the kind that this symposium addresses. Today I will address two of his recent projects, Forest of Stone Steeles, Retranslation and Rewriting of Tang Poetry, and Cultural Transference, a Neon Calligraphy series both of which explore creatively some of the problems and paradoxes of attempts to translate between Chinese and English languages and cultures. A rich understanding of these projects requires some knowledge of the work that first gained Gu international recognition and for which he remains best known today, his United Nations series of installations begun in 1993. The series consists of a sequence of what Gu calls monuments, ironically, made principally of human hair, fashioned into such elements as bricks, carpets, and curtains, and combined to create large quasi-architectural installations. Comprising national monuments made from hair collected within a single country and installed there, and transnational or universal monuments made of hair collected from around the world, Gu's series uses blended human hair as a metaphor for the utopian possibility of human unification through biological merger. At the same time, many works in the series, such as the iconic United Nations Babel of the Millennium from 1999, which I show you here, feature unreadable scripts based on English, Hindi, Arabic, and ancient Chinese seal script which symbolize the reality of linguistic and other cultural differences that continue to divide humanity. The largest pseudo-characters in this monument are synthesized from elements of ancient Chinese seal script and English letters. They are hybrid characters that evoke the cultural fusion brought about by globalization. Wenda Gu is fascinated by the ways in which globalization with its emphasis on transnational exchange in every sphere of human activity, necessitates translation between different languages and cultures, often resulting in misunderstanding. The artist himself cultivates cross-cultural confusion by using both the names Wenda Gu here in the West and Gu Wenda in Asia, his family name is Gu, his personal name is Wenda, and his imperfect English leads him to commit frequent misspellings and grammatical mistakes. Gu sees such misunderstanding as a positive force, declaring only through the misunderstanding can we create the new. On this basis, Gu conceived of an ambitious long-term project 
paralleling the United Nations series. They were conceived in the same year, 1993. That is his Forest of Stone Steely's retranslation and rewriting of Tang poetry, which employs a process he calls complex Chinese-English translation to create new post-Tang poems in Chinese and English out of the Tang originals and their English translations. And I will explain that process to you momentarily and even demonstrate it. In contrast, the United Nations series which seeks to transcend specific cultural definitions. The Forest of Stone Steely series is deeply rooted in Chinese cultural traditions, which it creatively transforms. Inspired by the famous Forest of Stone Steely's museum in Xi'an, which displays thousands of steles spanning Chinese history, Gu's series comprises 50 hand-carved and engraved slate steles, each weighing 1.3 tons and 2,500 ink rubbings made from their surfaces. After several years of planning, a team of expert craftsmen under Gu's employ in Xi'an produced the steles and rubbings through traditional methods beginning in 2000. The completed series was displayed in November 2005 in a grand installation at the OCT Contemporary Art Terminal in Shenzhen, which is uh, the slide I showed you earlier. Whereas traditional steles stand upright, Gu's are horizontal evoking the toppling of tradition and referencing death through their resemblance to tomb slabs. Historical steles typically bore epitaphs, imperial or official inscriptions, historical records, philosophical or literary texts, or examples of writing of famous calligraphers. Departing from such precedents to introduce an alternation between languages, each of Gu's steles and rubbings presents a series of poetic texts in English and Chinese, or Chinese and English, that switch between vertical and horizontal formats to signal the alter alternation between cultures. And to, I'm going to describe to you the layout of texts on, on one of the steles, but to help you follow it, I'm showing you the word processed starting point here at the left. The first text, which would be here and also here is a classic Tang Dynasty poem in its original Chinese form, presented in a vertical column at the upper right, based on a viewing position from the bottom of the stele. Characters in Gu's own calligraphy introduce the poem, which is engraved in characters that emulate the printed Fang Sung typeface. So these are um, Gu's characters, and then there's the poem in an engraved version of a typeface. The second text pre presented horizontally, so switching from a vertical orientation to a horizontal orientation, and this would be this text here in the word processed version. The second text is an English translation of the Tang poem by the American poet Witter Binner from his 1929 collection, The Jade Mountain. The third text presented vertically in large characters in Wenda Gu's distinctive calligraphy is his retranslation of Binner's English back into Chinese on the basis of sound rather than meaning. And we're going to demonstrate this in momentarily. Uh, we're going to have a, a poetry reading here in the middle of this paper. It is a transliteration rendered through Chinese characters whose Mandarin pronunciation approximates the sounds of Binner's English. I specify Mandarin because there are several different dialects of spoken Chinese, so he's using the Mandarin pronunciation here. The result, semantically, is bizarre. It's a surrealist text that Gu calls a post-Tang poem. The fourth text is Gu's retranslation of the post-Tang Chinese poem back into English. So that would be this text down here. On the basis of meaning, which makes the absurdity accessible to English readers. It's again presented horizontally, engraved in this Times New Roman typeface on the stele. And then finally, and this appears only on the stele and not in the word process version, there is a, a Chinese footnote explaining his uh, process that's accessible only to one who reads Chinese. 
The alternation in the steles between Chinese and English texts and between vertical and horizontal textual formats reflects the artist's transnational experience of moving back and forth frequently between the United States and China. So too does Gu's complex Chinese-English translation process, which uses the transliteration of English into Chinese to create new meanings. This method springs from the common transliteration of Western brand names into Mandarin through the use of characters whose pronunciation mimics the sounds of the Western language. <laughs> Mandarin being rich in homophones, characters that are pronounced identically, uh, provides numerous possibilities for transliterating the same Western word through entirely different characters. And this can produce a nonsensical string of characters used simply for their sound. Let me see if this works. If not, no worries. I don't know. That's OK. We don't need that. Um, for example, here we get my dang lao for McDonald's, which as you can see, literally means wheat should toil. And so someone on the Chinese street ignores the meaning and just hears the sound, or really they see the golden arches and the rest of it's sort of <laughs> just uh, an extra. However, careful transliteration can sometimes create a wonderfully appropriate new meaning in the target language. For example, Coca-Cola, transliterated as Coca-Cola, means soothe the mouth and brings joy to the drinker. I'm going to ask a Professor Ding Ning to come up now and help me in the poetry reading. <laughs> Gu's use of the process in Forest of Stone Steles is closer to the first example in its creation of absurdity. Essentially, he's mocking serious attempts to translate poetry such as Binner's. So we're going to return here to the text of number, the steely number two. We're going to move this, the monitor so Professor Ding Ning can. He's going to read the Tong original and listen to the beautiful Chinese poetry here. Li Bai, Ye Si, Chang Qian, Ming Yue Guang, Yi Si, Di Shang Shuang, Ju Tou, Wang Ming Yue, Di Tou, Si Gu Xiang. And here is um, Witter Binner's translation of that into English. And listen carefully to the sounds of the English, because then Professor Ding is going to read the transliteration as pronounced in Mandarin. In the quiet night, Tang Dynasty, Li Bai. So bright a gleam on the foot of my bed. Could there have been a frost already? Lifting myself to look, I found that it was moonlight. Sinking back again, I thought suddenly of home. Now Professor Ding is going to read this. So pu lai tu e ge li ling ang ze fu de a fu mai bai de ku de zai er hai fu bing e fu lo si da re di le fu ting man sai pu lu tu ke ai fang de <laughs> in case you didn't understand that in Chinese, Gu now retranslates that post Tang poem back into English. Tracking down its catch, leprosy cuts the fox and gazelle hungrily as a woman sells bad morals in Ang Pond Mansion. Her crying baby cunningly eats an illed moth. The woman wantonly beat the child who asked for it. <laughs> Veils of haze over the happy man pagoda. A walker sucks the muddy water tears in her dreams. He who comes along this road is sad and fang de burning with the desire to slaughter. The loose, haughty red lady rides on her horse to visit a friend. <laughs> the laughter provoked by the post-Tong poem is fitting. Gu's work is basically a form of creative play. Philosophically, it seeks to demonstrate that while meaning can be translated, culture, such as a poem, cannot. The attempt to translate culture always results in misunderstanding, 
and often in absurdity, which is nevertheless creative in its own right. In other words, translation engenders creative transformation. The Steelys also display Gu's creativity as a calligrapher in their central columns of engraved characters, evoking the traditional carving of master calligraphy in stone to preserve it for posterity. Analysis of the distinctive features of Gu's calligraphy is beyond the scope of this paper. I will simply note that his style incorporates elements of ancient script styles which give it a bold, archaic flavor. The use of the steelies to produce ink rubbings, traditionally meant to reproduce and disseminate prized calligraphy, reinforces the connection of Gu's writing to that of honored calligraphers of the past. Through these references, Gu presents his own calligraphy as worthy of preservation, admiration, and perhaps even induction into the canon of great Chinese calligraphy. But the absurd content of the writing itself defends Gu against charges of hubris. He can claim that he is only kidding and that the impressive historicizing presentation of his writing is only meant to throw its literary lightness into relief. Around the time he was completing his Forest of Stone Steely series, Gu embarked on a complementary project that he came to call Cultural Transference, a neon calligraphy series. Here I show you just two of the five works in the series. These two are subtitled University of Pittsburgh and Sotheby's. In both of them, Gu employs the same creative process of complex English-Chinese translation that he developed for the Steelys, but now takes as his verbal starting point the names of a Western institution, University of Pittsburgh, and of a corporation, Sotheby's, written in small yellow Roman neon letters in the top register. Both signs present in their center register large outlined red neon characters in the same distinctive calligraphy we saw in the Steelys that transliterate the sounds of the Western names into Mandarin Chinese. In the bottom register, we find new English poems Gu created by translating the Chinese back into English. So University of Pittsburgh, through this process, yields the poem Shiny Neon flows on colorful silk green China treasure pavilion. And Sotheby's becomes simple thoughts, green temple. These neons take a very different verbal starting point than do the Steelys, a modern institutional or commercial name rather than a classic Tong poem, which through Gu's translation process yields much shorter new Chinese and English texts that can be consumed quickly. And these texts are rendered in a very different medium, colorful, glowing neon, rather than somber, engraved steelies and ink rubbings. Gu intends his neons to translate into a glamorous contemporary medium what he calls the ancient treasure of calligraphy, an art long central to Chinese culture that is in Oops, you know, I skipped a sentence, which was going to say that these new features connect the neon calligraphy series to the modern urban commercial environment, rather than to the classical Chinese past, to the bustling street with its punchy advertising language, rather than to the hushed museum or library. Gu intends his neons to translate into a glamorous contemporary medium what he calls the ancient treasure of calligraphy, an art long central to Chinese culture that in Gu's view has lost much of its popularity, especially among the young. Appropriating a commercial medium for a cultural purpose, Gu's neons advertise calligraphy, specifically his own calligraphy, as an art form, investing it with a level of importance similar to that claimed for it in different terms by the engraved steelies and ink rubbings. I want to conclude with an analysis of the Sotheby's neon, which Gu made independent of any commission during the buildup to Sotheby's first ever New York auction of contemporary Chinese art in March 2006. Gu broke the company's name down into fragments presented on four separate plexiglass backed panels. So here are the fragments of Sotheby's. He transliterated these as these large central characters, Su Su Bi Su then translated the characters as Simple Thoughts, Green Temple. 
The neon presents these elements in horizontal rows, while a fifth panel at the right bears a vertical line of characters with a red seal serving as uh, Gu's signature. In its medium and format, Gu's neon strongly resembles a commercial street sign of the sort commonly seen in Chinese cities, a sign including English alongside Chinese as a way of attracting English-speaking customers. The concluding character of Gu's neon highlights the similarity of its layout to a Buddhist temple sign, such as that identifying the Jade Buddha Temple in Shanghai. The latter has the same terminal character appearing at the left rather than the right because the sign is written in left to right fashion, the older reading format of horizontally written Chinese. You can see that, that the terminal character here is the same as the terminal character here. Consistent with the commercial connotations of its medium, Gu's Neon also resembles a shop sign, such as this one for a tea store in Beijing or the four character signs posted on the lintels of Chinese homes to invoke such benefits as happiness, longevity, or prosperity. Gu's English translation of the central Chinese is fairly straightforward, the only idiosyncrasy being his rendition of B as green rather than its standard definition of green jade. So a better de definition of this character would be green jade. Significantly, unlike the nonsensical post-Tang poetry in the Forest of Stone Steeles, the English verse at the base of this neon demonstrates genuine poetic accomplishment. Simple Thoughts, Green Temple, features a pleasingly simple grammatical structure. Adjective noun, adjective noun, with a symmetrical arrangement of syllables in its four words, as you can see diagrammed here, two, one, one, two, and approximate rhyme between the opening and closing words, simple, temple, creating an overall effect of symmetry, harmony, and enclosure, all aptly associated with the idea of a temple, Chinese and Western temples often being symmetrical in design. Simple thoughts suggest a meditative mental state appropriate for a temple, while green generates associations with spring, new life, environmentalism, and the color's supposed calming psychological effect, resonant with the idea of a temple. But Gu says he chose green for its American association with cash. <laughs> he may even have used the character B for green because it is a Mandarin homophone of B meaning money. For Gu, green temple means money temple which skews simple thoughts toward a simple focus on profit, which is the very raison d'etre of Sotheby's. Yet, the placid and contemplative quality of Gu's verse is antithetical to the financial frenzy of the overheated art market stoked by Sotheby's auctions, allowing us to read an ironic divergence between the values of Sotheby's and the new Chinese and English poems Gu discovers in its name through cultural transference. These complementary projects by Wenda Gu, Forest of Stone Steely's retranslation and rewriting of Tang poetry, and Cultural Transference, a neon calligraphy series, offer rich aesthetic and intellectual rewards. The first series strongly references and playfully reworks classical Chinese cultural elements, poetry, steely's, calligraphy, ink rubbings, in dark and weighty and grave stone slabs and austerely beautiful black and white ink rubbings. The second series, while also glorifying the Chinese treasure of calligraphy, draws its inspiration from contemporary advertising and commercial signage, its electrified neon tubes glowing with alluring light and color. Uniting the series is their shared conceptual basis and use of the complex English-Chinese translation process to harness East-West misunderstanding as a force for new creation with its own cultural value and resonance. Wenda Gu's signature artistic contribution to the long and tumultuous relationship we have come together here to address. Thank you. <laughs>